right, Shabbat Shalom, everyone who's joining us as we continue. Thank you. I wasn't expecting a response. Thank you. <laughs> as we continue our service with the message portion of our service, and we're going to continue to go through the book of Luke. This is Luke part 18, and we're going to pick up today um, Luke 3.17. Um, last week we went through verses 9 through 16 in which we saw Yochanan not only immersing those who came out to see for themselves what was going on, but also to answer questions. And you'll notice that when he answered the questions, he was very direct. He was very to the point. There was a direct purpose in his answers. There was clarity in his answers and a sense of urgency um, in how he ministered, how he answered them. And in the, the answers, there was actual direction of do this, don't do that. Very specific things for the specific people who asked the questions. He was there to usher in the return of Messiah as the forerunner, and so he didn't have time to, you know, dilly-dally or try and you know, when you're doing something on purpose and intentionally, you just do it. You're not um, wasting a lot of emotions or, um, you know, you're just doing it. You know, when you, I think about when you're hungry and you're heading to the restaurant, you know, and all you can think about is eating. You're not just wasting time and just you're going straight to where you need to go. Amen? Also... He wasn't there to argue with people. He wasn't there to debate. He wasn't there to be derailed in any way from what Adonai had called him to do. And there were people who came to challenge what he had to say. The religious leaders of the time who had authority and had respect of the people around. And he wasn't afraid to answer them and answer them tru truthfully, knowing what it could actually cost him. Which, as we know from Scripture, cost him his life. But he did all of this, and because of it, he was found incredibly pleasing to Adonai. So after he answers all these specific questions from the crowds, he begins to speak in a broader way, not about what the people are to do, but about what Adonai is going to do and is about to do. He shifts gears. That being said, we, we've been talking about this idea of balance, how we need to operate in balance doing what we know we need to do, and at the same time, recognizing that Adonai, what Adonai is doing around us and make sure that we are lined up with the actions of Adonai as well. That makes sense? So let's pick up where we left off, Luke chapter 3, verse 17. This is talking about, in the, first, the verses preceding this, is talking about the, um, the discipline of God, the judgment of God, depending on what level it gets to. It goes from discipline to judgment at some point if there's no repentance. But here's what he says. He says, he has with him his winnowing fork to clear out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the straw with unquenchable fire. This is pretty straightforward when you read it, but I want to dig into it a little deeper. Oh, nice. Nice. I didn't, I, sometimes I don't know what's behind me when I'm, what's on the screen. Nice. So what, who is the he in the scripture he's talking about? It's Adonai. It's Hashem. He's not talking about what God is going to do or has the potential to do. And what is he doing in the verse? He's about to clear out his threshing floor. You can look at this section, um, this verse here, and you can look at it as it's prophetic, talking about what the Lord is going to do, um, what he may do, really what he may do even. He's going to clean things out. The question is whether or not the people um, who are involved in being cleaned out, if they've repented or not. You know, God's going to clean his house. He's going to clean his people. For us, is we need to make sure that we're ones who don't need him to come clean us out. We need to be him, be the ones who are helping him to do the cleaning and or, at very least, not the object of his winnowing fork uh, that gets uh, 
gets thrown into the fire. That being said, he's about to clear his threshing floor. And for the benefit of those who don't know what a threshing floor is, I want to explain that to you. And just before I do, I want to say something else I didn't put here, but I want to say. In prophecy, in prophetic scriptures, according to Jewish interpretation, everything bad that a prophet says or does that's prophetic doesn't have to happen. The only thing that has to happen is good. If a prophet prophesies over someone, they're going to be blessed, that kind of thing. That has to happen, and not only does it have to happen, it has to happen to the T. Whereas the other side of it, if a prophet prophesies something by the Lord and says that judgment is coming and this and that and the other is going to happen, that doesn't have to happen. Can anybody tell me why? People can repent. Can anybody give me an example? Jonah and Nineveh, the Ninevites. But you notice with them, they repented for a while, but then history tells us that it was like typical, wasn't long lasting, they all got toasted anyway. Um, but also another, who else? King Hezekiah. And he had an absolute death sentence given to him. But yet, not only did he live and he wasn't judged, but he lived and prospered and his relationship with Adonai was was blessed. So just remember that when we think about prophecies and prophetic things, especially in the book of Matthew and Luke, I think Luke 12, is that where it is? Matthew 24, Revelation. That doesn't mean that all that has to happen. What it does mean is that it will happen if things don't change. But we have, this is where we come in. We actually have the ability to help tip the scales so this thing doesn't, um, these things don't necessarily have to happen. And at very least, it won't happen to us. Or we will be saved through and not obliterated by the things that are to come. You know, you could, if when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, you could have a nuke go off and nuke everything around you, but you're still there. When um, it says in the Psalms, a thousand may fall at my side. And 10,000 on my right hand, but it won't come near me, for only with my eyes shall I look and see um, the recompense of the wicked, because I've set my eyes upon the Lord. Uh, for the Lord is my refuge, even a strong tower is my inhabitation. No evil shall befall me, nor shall any plague come near my dwelling. For he has given his angels charge concerning me. They shall bear me up in their hands, lest I even dash my foot against the stone. So we have that. That's us. That's you. That's your decision to make how close you want to be to the Lord following him so that you can enter into a greater level of protection than what we see around us. Amen? So for the benefit of those who don't know what a threshing floor is or haven't really talked about it or considered it, I want to explain. A a threshing floor is a floor where the wheat is brought in while it is still in its husk and connected to some of its straw or shaft. It's placed on the threshing on the floor, and it's beaten. This beating separates, separates the wheat from everything else. How many of you know that you're going to be separated unto Adonai? It's going to be involve some shaking, involve some dif- discomfort, and even maybe p- potentially some beating of some variety to accomplish this. With this threshing floor experience, the wheat goes um, uh, with this threshing floor experience the wheat goes through, it finds itself having had all of its surroundings beaten off or shaken off. How many ever felt like things around you being beaten off or shaken off? Or Lord tells you something you don't want to listen, he's got to just beat it off or shake it off. There's a term, kind of a new term, it talks about someone fighting or something. He says, you know, he beat his brakes off. <laughs> but that's what it's like, got your, your brakes beaten off. And for any of you who ever worked on a car, anybody ever change brakes in a car? Yeah. Sometimes you got to take a sledgehammer and beat the brakes off. <laughs> Just to put the new ones on. But this kernel of wheat goes from being alone in its shaft to having an having as an individual, or it goes from being alone in its shaft to, have, to being an individual kernel to being a part of a community of kernels in the same situation 
poor little colonel, but he's not alone. This would make a good kid's cartoon. But beaten and shaken, but not isolated and alone anymore. Sounds a lot like a community of believers, doesn't it? After the wheat is beaten, the winnowing fork is taken, and it scoops up the wheat, the straw, and the husk, and it throws it up into the air. Everything blows away except for the wheat, which falls back to the threshing floor. How many of you have ever had people just, people or situations or things that didn't belong in your life, at a night just sends a wind of some sort and just blows them away? And leaves you in a position where you're pure and better, more dedicated and consecrated and able to be pleasing to him. Just by removing all the junk that was around you. Just by beating your brakes off if necessary. <laughs> but what's even worse than that is a straw also gets burned up in a fire, it says. But the wheat is gathered up into the barn. What a picture of heaven and hell and life on earth. In this world, you're going to get beaten up, thrown up in the air, and allowed to even fall down. But at the end of this awaits the fellowship with the like-minded who have been through the same process. And the gathering up of all of us unto Adonai. You know, we've got to set our mind and our our vision on what's to come and not on what we're going through at any given moment. Not on the valley that we're walking through, but on the other side. Amen? The wheat cleaned and stripped of all, <clears throat> of all the things that are not longer needed for it. The things that are at one time we thought were necessary, we realize that they're no longer necessary. The people that we thought were once necessary, we realize they're not necessary anymore. And we can separate ourselves even from things or allow Adonai to do the separating. Thankfully, the threshing floor experience doesn't last forever. Just a season like most of life. I'm glad I'm not on being beaten on the threshing floor forever. It's just a season of time. It comes in seasons, but it comes in necessary seasons. There comes a time where, you know, that husk that is still hanging on to your backside needs to be knocked off. And either you can do it or maybe Adonai is going to do it. But in order for you to take the next step and move into the next season appropriately, that husk has to be removed. Sometimes it doesn't feel good. Sometimes it feels like a scab coming off of a, a still fresh wound. Dade coming off, uh, you know, of your body. You know, one of the worst things I want to do, if, you, if I were to cut my arm, most men have hairy arms, and you cut your arm, have to put a Band-Aid on it. Oh, my gosh. Or, I, you know, I tell you, this go and give blood. You know, right there, they give you blood, and they, the nurse is real nice and sweet, and bam, they stick on this Gorilla Glue bandage. Leave it on there for a half hour, hour, and you've got to go pull it off, and there's hairs, bing, 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 that are coming off with it. Sometimes these things are necessary. In the context of the Bible, what is the most important threshing floor that we know about? Well, the threshing floor. And what threshing floor is he talking about? Jerusalem, where the temple was built. 2 Samuel 24, 18 says basically the same thing as 1 Chronicles 21, 18 says. It says, Gad came to David that day and said to him, Go, set up an altar to Adonai on the threshing floor of Aravna the Yevusi. Ornan the Jebusite. It says it, First Chronicles 21, 18, a little different. Then the angel of Adonai ordered Gad to tell David to go and set up an altar to Adonai on the threshing floor of Ornan the Yevusi, the Jebusite. 
Remember the whole story about them purchasing the threshing floor. Why? Why there? That's where the temple was to be built. 1 Peter 4.17 says, For the time has come for judgment to begin. It begins with what? The household of God. Or you can read it, the house of God. I mean, they're connected. The household of God, the people of God, the house of God. You can't separate them. They're all one. Amen? And if it starts with us, what will be the outcome for those who are disobeying God's good news? Not good. At some point or another, you get to decide whether you're the wheat or the shaft. We have this decision to make. But again, I want to say to people who say, well, you know, God is sovereign. He does everything. He doesn't. Talk to him. He wants you to accept his son while you can. Judgment and discipline always starts in the house of God. And I'm going to make mention of this, but I'm not going to get into it a whole lot. The world is under constant judgment. We're under constant judgment, and God is constantly looking and judging what's going on. We may not be disciplined all the time or immediately for uh, sin or for um, you know, bad actions, but we're constantly. So you don't think so? We're constantly under judgment by society. Go drive your car down the street and go 100 miles an hour down Shaw in front of a police officer and see what happens. Break the law. You pay the penalty of breaking the law. Even believers. Well, we're no longer under the law of sin. No, we are. We still have to do. We're not law. God hasn't called us to send his son um, that we receive him so that we can become lawbreakers. Disobedient to the law, no. Absolutely not. Judgment and discipline always starts in the house of God and specifically in the text, the temple, among God's people. Which of God's people is this referring to? Jewish people. You know, you have to read things in context to get the full understanding of them. You can't... I've been talking to people um, about things that and I've... I think I found a better way of getting a point across without being offensive. And it's this. People, there's an idea that is taught that basically every promise in the Bible, you can just go and name and claim and take it for yours, but you can't. What you can do, you can say, hey, you know, God, you blessed them, and that's a wonderful thing that you did for them. Can you please do that for me too? So the principle of it you can act on. The absolute, well, you know, he did it for them. He's got to do it for, No, no, no. He did it for them at a specific time for a specific reason. That's it. Recognize that or you'll be confused and you'll wonder why you're saying all these things, doing all these things, and nothing is changing, and it'll affect your faith in God, that you think that God is something. He's mad at me or I've done something. No, you just, your understanding is off. We always need to start with our understanding when something isn't right. Am I understanding this right or not? That's the place to start. And change your mind. Repent of things that you thought before that you now know are not right. Repent of it and turn and go the other. That's it. Very simple. Hallelujah. But judgment and discipline always starts in the house of God, specifically in the text, the temple, among God's people, especially with God's people who have received Messiah there's an even higher expectation. How many of you know we have, there's, uh, God expects more of us than he does of someone who just received him? How many of you are living up to what, I'm not, I'm not going to look at anybody, you're living up to what he, these newer, ex, excuse me, these newer expectations of him. You know, we're all on a path, on a grade. Remember back in school, some teachers would, would grade on a curve, we're all on this curve somewhere. But I talked about Job and how his friends looked upon him with an hara, the evil eye, and they caused Satan to take notice. And what did Satan do? He, took, he went to the throne room and accused him before God, and God saw, you know what, I'm going to have to let him be sifted like wheat. 
Because his friends, his friends projected that on him. We can't do that kind of thing to one another. I'm going to have to teach on that one day, but now you, the cat's out of the bag. But we can't do that to one another. That's the definition of the evil lie. You're, you're putting on someone and causing someone else to receive judgment that maybe they wouldn't have, it would have been left dormant for lack of a better. We can't do, I can't, we can't do that as friends and brothers and sisters to one another. When I say we need to look at each other favorably, with ein uh, tov, a, a good eye, a favorable eye, and overlook. You know, Noah's son came in and saw the situation with his father in the tent. And he went out and he called his, the rest, uh, his brother and said, hey, let's go and not expose dad. Let's walk in and back up and cover him and take care of him. They could have done the exact opposite. They could have accused him and looked at him with the evil eye and put him in a position to be judged by God. And if I remember right, don't quote me because I haven't read it in a long time, but he hadn't really done anything. He didn't do anything wrong. He was just laying in his tent. He didn't have any clothes. He's in his own tent. I need to reread that section again. I haven't read it in a while. But we need to watch how we view other people and the things we say. We don't want to put people in a position where we're the reason why they had unnecessary grief and sifting come their direction. Recognize our threshing floor experience is for our good, and ultimately it's for the glory of God. In Luke 3.18, it continues, And with many other warnings besides these, he announced the good news to the people. But Yochanan also denounced Herod, the regional governor, for taking his own wife, Herodias, the wife of his brother, and for all the other wicked things Herod had done. Well, we just talked about this whole idea of looking at someone favorably or with an evil eye. When Yochanan stood up and renounced the deeds of Herod, was he looking at him with an evil eye? No. No. He was a ruler who had done something in front of everybody that was so breaking of Torah that, I mean, it didn't even, everybody knew this. It wasn't like he had done some hidden thing that got exposed. He did this stuff publicly. You know, we see officials today in politics doing things, and people to varying degrees would have something to say. Is there something wrong with that? No, they're just saying if something is righteous or not, and they're uh, they're supposed to be representing us. And if they are not, then it's perfectly okay to say something. Um, so that's what happened. Yochanan made a public declaration denouncing the ruling authority. The problem was, for Yochanan, it got back to Herod. Didn't turn out so well for Yochanan in the end. He did what he was called to do, but it cost him. Remember last week we talked about the guards most likely being Herod's guards, Herod's Jewish guards who he sent out. Other Jewish men who had witnessed Yochanan immersing many. And remember, Yochanan told them, when I say guards, I mean soldiers is the word I want to use. Remember, Yochanan told them to quit uh, intimidating people and stealing from them. How do I know he was stealing from them? When you're in a place of authority with the ability to use deadly force and you intimidate people and you're not content with what you're being paid, what do you think they would do? Steal, extort, whatever the case is, some kind of way, finagle money from someone in an evil way. They do dishonest things to the people. They do dishonest things to their brothers and sisters. And sadly, remember this. People are people. Remember the, when Yeshua was talking about the, high, the priests in the temple basically stealing from the old ladies. When they were the ones who were supposed to be there to take care of the old widows, but they were instead stealing from them and watching them just struggle. And we see that situation again happen in the book of Acts when the forming of the, uh, uh, um, of the deacons, the... Um, 
the Shamashim, when they, these new, was it the Herodians, widows, weren't getting their proper portion and they were going without. And they stopped and said, hey, you know, not only is that not kosher on any level, but we're going to form, we're going to get a committee together of honorable men who aren't allowed this kind of stuff to happen. You know, it matters how we treat one another. It mattered how they treated one another. And we shouldn't have to have a committee be assembled to cause us to do what's right. That's straight Torah that everybody knows. I mean, that's a, a shame that that, that, that that had to happen. On the other side of it, we trust God that he's not going to just sit and allow things to go on forever without any dealing with it. Amen? Hallelujah. But we see this kind of thing still today, sadly. I just read an article where 54 CHP officers were charged with overtime fraud. Same kind of idea. Not satisfied with their pay. Took it into their hands to do something evil when people are trusting them to do what's right. They represent the law and righteousness and safety and peace and help. Continuing in verse uh, 20, it says, Whereupon Herod added this to the rest. He locked up Yochanan in prison. So who do you think went and arrested Yochanan? Probably those same soldiers who had witnessed what he had said. Remember, these are Jews, too. You don't have witnesses to, to this. This is conflict within the house of Israel. Those of us who are in the natural, not in the house of Israel, we have our own conflict. Household and family conflict is not, is in every group, in every race, Jew, Gentile alike. But this was clear conflict within the house of Israel. Yochanan wasn't arrested for coming against Rome. He was arrested for coming against the rulership of the house of Israel, Herod. Sad situation. How many of you know that conflict within a home is worse than conflict with your neighbor? We've lived with neighbors we didn't get along with, you know. A good fence helps that. <laughs> Coming outside when they're not there, going inside when they are there helps a lot of that. How many know within your own home, within your own community, you can't get away? You've got to be extra careful and extra sweet to one another. Every day I wake up and say, you know, I've got to be just like Pam today. I've got to be just sweet to everybody. <laughs> Treat everybody right. <laughs> I, I do, I do. <laughs> I'm feeling fixed on. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It is. <laughs> but I believe that Yeshua, he got to witness much of this or all of it. Perhaps even the arrest of Yochanan. As it continues to talk about here in verse 21, while all the people were being immersed, Yeshua too was immersed. So Yeshua didn't just show up by himself with Yochanan waiting and no. He was immersed at the same time. There were crowds. There were a lot of people there who witnessed this. You see the movies. I think I saw one movie and all of a sudden John, he's there, you know, and all of a sudden here comes Messiah and there's like no one around or maybe a few people just way off in the distance. And there's this glorious thing, just the two of them with the Holy Spirit coming down. And you hear like a choir, ha, you know, and the hallelujah chorus breaks out and the angels are rejoicing in the heavens, which probably happened. 
But there were many, 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 many witnesses to this. Many. We talk about the day of Pentecost when the, um, when the tongues of fire came down and everyone saw. Well, this is the day when the Messiah was anointed. The King of Kings and Lord, the one who would be the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and eventually will sit on the throne of David. This is an inauguration of inauguration, well, not inauguration, a, um, uh, uh, um, well, yeah, it wasn't quite the coronation, but it was a um, anointing, it was an anointing right then of a future coronation, which, hasn't, which will happen, hasn't happened yet. And many people were there to, to witness it. While all the people were being immersed, Yeshua too was immersed. As he was praying, heaven was opened. Why was he praying? You know, again, I'm going to keep bringing this up, and I'm, I know I'm making it sound like a joke, but it needs to be continued to say because people don't understand it. It hurts them. Why did he just come and let God do it all? Surely the Father could have done the, um, the anointing and the praying and the speaking. No, Yeshua had a part to play too. Even in this, he was praying to God. What do you think? I don't know exactly what he was praying, but I can 100% with certainty say he was praying in agreement with the will of God being done in his life. With the anointing that was to come upon him to do the work that he was called to do, that he would do it. He wasn't coming against the plan or the will of God, the will of the Father. Why? Because they were one. They were echad. He said, whatever the Father does, I do. Whatever he says, I say. I'm not separate. I'm the nice Messiah of the New Testament. That's my old crusty dad who is the... You know, that's how they treat him, like he's the old man who says, get off my lawn, kids. That's not right. When you say Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, and forever, you're saying... Guess what else you're saying with that? The Father is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Guess what else you're saying with that? Believe this or not. The Ruach, the Spirit of God, is the same yesterday and forever. They're not separate at odds and can be separated from one another. And they're not, he's not limited to manifesting as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit either. There's countless times through Scripture we see otherwise. We need to look upon and look at what was taught for thousands of years before Messiah ever came. Then he came, he walked, and he never corrected and said, oh, no, 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 you don't need that anymore. That's incorrect with the, that teaching. He never did that. All he ever said, I think it's in around Matthew, uh, Matthew 13 or so-ish, don't quote me, but he said, he didn't say, you know, Stay away from the Pharisees, have nothing to do with them. He didn't say that. You know what he said about him? He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. You know, we have our challah bread every week, and I watch Casey make it. He doesn't put some big old vat of leaven in like a little bit of flour and a little... It's mainly flour and water and a little bit of leaven. Thank you. A little bit. He's saying, beware of these little, these little things that they do that, it, sadly, it's ruining the other stuff they say, not because the other stuff they're saying is wrong, but because it causes people to, they can't trust the other stuff. Because they're basically saying, hey, you know what, you come and come up here. I got a thousand pounds to put on your back, and they're not willing to carry a feather. And they would do things to make you feel guilty because you didn't do that. What's the matter with you? Why aren't you carrying that thousand pounds and, and I, when I'm not carrying this feather? Why? And people would say, man, I'm just, you know, how can I come against? How can I stand against the, these ruling authorities? They couldn't. He said, beware of that. Not the Torah teaching, the teachings from the prophets and the, uh, and the rabbis of Israel that they taught. He's saying, watch out for that leaven that they're putting in there because that leaven's messing things up. It's not the gas in your gas tank that causes problems. It's the little 
teaspoon of sugar that someone puts in it or the cup of water that gets in that ruins it. The gas was fine. It's just whatever is causing it to be ruined. That's where the problem is. That's all he ever said. And if anyone can find everything, anything different, please let me know. I, you know. I'd love to see it. I can't find anything. He never said reject them and leave them alone and just know they were his people. He loved them. Yeah, exactly. You know, someone say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where'd I leave off? Oh, here we go. Uh, Verse 22, the Ruach HaKodesh came down on him in a physical form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. And this is an actual audible voice. This is what's referred to as like the 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 bot call the the remnant of the voice of God that can still be. This is a voice that people heard. And the voice said, God said, You are my son whom I love. I am well pleased with you. And other people heard it. Not just him and Yochanan. All of them. Many who had come out there heard it. And then many went back to wherever they came from and testified of their eyewitness account of seeing with their eyes, hearing with their ears, and experiencing that. Many. Another interaction with the Ruach HaKodesh prior to Shavuot Pentecost, I might add, or the Pentecost after Messiah uh, went back to be with the Father. It's interesting. According to Josephus in the Antiquities of the Jews, 18... Uh, 117, it says that Yochanan was highly respected within the Jewish community. We got to remember the Jewish community, your community meant everything. And I don't, when I say community to those who aren't um, understanding of Jewish things, I don't mean, you know, where you live. I don't mean your neighborhood, although that's in there as well. But the Jewish community was everything. You know, you went to the synagogue for everything for services, to meet people, for political reasons. You went to bring an animal to be kosherly kosherly, uh, slaughtered. All of these things you did in the synagogue. And you lived in a small community where you you knew what was going on at this one's house and that one's house. You knew these things. Not like today where we don't know our neighbor what's going on. Shavuot Tov. Praise you, O God. But according to Josephus, Yochanan was a highly respected man within the Jewish community. And Josephus says that John was a good man who instructed his people to exercise virtue towards both their fellow man and God. And this isn't even concerning when he was immersing people. This is his regular daily life within the community. He did the great work of in Hebrew, what is called avodah, which is the, is, is the work, is the righteous work that he was called to. And he did it to usher in the first coming of Messiah. What are we doing today? Doing our righteous work so that we can usher in the second coming of Messiah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Luke 3.23, I'm almost done here, it says, I have it right here. Can I see your Bible? I said I was going to say it, but, oh, never mind, never mind, I have another section here. I've got a different version here, but I want to read it. Luke 3.23, Yeshua himself, when he began to teach, was about 30 years old, being the son of Joseph, the son of uh, heli is what it says in this translation. I'm not sure what yours says. Oh, it says Eli. In, okay, yeah. Heli in English or in, uh, in Hebrew. But it's interesting about this passage. I want to just point out one thing in Hebrew. It says that Yeshua, English, when he began to teach, he was about 30 years old, being the son of Joseph, the son of El Eli. Well, that doesn't say a whole lot. In Hebrew, here's what it says. It uses the, the words et 
Avodato. What is that? It's a specific, it has to do with a specific ongoing work. So it doesn't just say that he taught. It says that he basically took on the specific ongoing work of teaching. That was his avodah, his righteous work, was to come and to teach the people. He didn't just casually just come and just teach. That was his call to come in and his life's work to teach his people Torah. And then to ultimately die for them. You know, if we look at something, I don't look at, you know, I can look at coming here on Shabbat and okay, I'm coming, I'm going to teach today. It's different if I look at it and say, it is my, my work, my holy work to come and teach. Totally different thing. Oh, well, you know, I went to the congregation today, so I just sat and I listened. Different than, oh, you know, I came, the, I went on Shabbat to sit down and to take heed and to listen and to grasp what was being taught. Totally different. And the end result is totally different how you'll come out. The end result is how I teach is totally different than if I oh, I'm just, I just come in and just, you know. I just open the Bible up for a few minutes and just have something to say and to put no effort into it, no nothing, and just totally different. May we be about the Father's avodah, the holy works, the righteous works of Him. Amen. There's a it may be coming up. I have um, this set of my computer in chunks. I'm always working on different chunks of it, so I'm not sure when it's coming up. So I won't say what I was thinking, because I think it's coming up in the next weeks. But again, I repeat, may we continue to do the great work, the great avodah, the works that he's called us to do. You know, the, and, and I'm just going to say this. In English, we hear the Ten Commandments. And that sounds like, okay, you do that. Don't do that. All of us don't do this. You guys can do that. That's what it sounds like. In Hebrew, it's not that. It's the mitzvot. And a good work, a righteous work. You go out and you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. You go and love your neighbors. That's for you to do. So you get this idea of, oh, I've got something to do. I've got some work to do. Because when I see you next week, if I say, hey, did you do it? Or if you come in with the expectation, hey, they may ask if I actually did it. It's different than, well, God has commanded to love your neighbor as yourself. Totally different. Totally different. So may we do the great work that Adonai has called for each of us to do as a congregation. Amen. So, Father, we praise you and worship you. We thank you for again for this time together. And as we come to the end of our service, we just thank you that we had another Shabbat of peace, another Shabbat of truth, another Shabbat of health, O oh God, and, and wealth to our, our whole being, O oh God. Whenever we spend time in your word or spend time with b other believers who were like-minded, it causes us to continue to make aliyah, continue to move forward and closer to you. And we pray, oh God, that as we learn more things, that they don't get stuck in our minds as information, but they make the journey to our hearts, oh God, and they become life to us. They become instruction to us. And we don't look at them and see them as just the commandments of God, but we see them as the, mitz the mitzvot. What is he telling me to do? And we do those things, O oh God, so that we may cause people to give glory to you. So we thank you and praise you for all of this. In the mighty name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, amen and amen. Hallelujah. And let me know when we're all clear.